Chapter 4 By the late summer, news of what had happened at the animal farm had spread across half the country. Every day, Snowball Napoleon sent out flights of pigeons whose instructions were to mingle with the animals on neighboring farms, tell them the story of the rebellion, and teach them the tune of Beasts of England. Most of the time, Mr. Jones had spent sitting in the tap room with the Red Lion at Wellington, complaining to anyone who would listen to the monstrous injustice he had suffered in being turned out of his property by a pack of good-for-nothing animals. The other farmers sympathized in principle, but they did not at first give him much help. At heart, each of them was secretly wondering whether he could not somehow turn Jones's misfortune to his own advantage. It was lucky that the owners of the two farms which adjoined Animal Farm were on permanently bad terms. One of them, which was named Foxwood, was a large, neglected, old-fashioned farm much outgrown by woodland, with all its pastures worn out and its hedges in disgraceful condition. Its owner, Mr. Pinkleton, was an easy-going gentleman farmer who spent most of his time in fishing or hunting according to the season. The other farm, which was called Pitchfield, was smaller and better kept. Its owner was a Mr. Frederick, a tough, shrewd man, perpetually involved in lawsuits and with a name for driving hard bargains. These two disliked each other so much that it was difficult for them to come to any agreement, even in defense of their own interest. Nevertheless, they were both thoroughly frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm and the very anxious to prevent their own animals from learning too much about it. At first they pretended to laugh, to scorn the idea of animals managing a farm for themselves. The whole thing would be over in a fortnight, they said. They put it about the animals of the manor farm. They insisted on calling it the manor farm, which would not tolerate the name Animal Farm were perpetually fighting among themselves and were also rapidly starving to death. When time passed and the animals had evidently not starved to death, Frederick and Pinkleton changed their tune and began to talk of the terrible wickedness that now flourished on Animal Farm. It was given out that the animals there practiced cannibalism tortured one another with red-hot horseshoes and had their females in common. That was, this was what came to rebelling against the laws of nature, Redrick and Pinkleton said. However, these stories were never fully believed. Rumors of a wonderful farm where the human beings had turned out and that the animals managed to own affair and manage their own affairs continued to circulate in vague and distorted forms and throughout that year a wave of rebelliousness ran through the countryside. Bulls, which had always been tractable, suddenly turned savage. Sheeps broke down hedges and devoured the clover. Cows kicked the pails over. Hunters refused their fences and shot their riders on the other side. Above all, the tunes and even the words of the Beast of England were known everywhere. It was spread with astonishing speed. The human beings could not contain their rage when they heard this song, though they pretended to think it merely ridiculous. They could not understand, they said, how even animals could bring themselves to sing such a contemptible rubbish. Any animal caught singing it would, was given a flogging on the spot, and yet the song was irrepressible. The blackbirds whistled it in the hedges, the pigeons cooed it in the elms. It got to the dins of the smitheries and the tunes of the church bells, and when the human beings listened to it, they secretly trembled, hearing it, hearing in it a prophecy of their future doom. Early in October, when the corn was cut and stacked and some of it was already threshed, a flight of pigeons came whirling through the air and alighted in the yard of Animal Farm in the wildest excitement. Jones and his men, with half a dozen others from Foxford and Pitchfield, had entered a five-barreled gate with which coming up the cart track had led to the farm. They were all carrying sticks, except Jones, who was marching ahead with a gun in his hands. Obviously, they were going to attempt to recapture the farm. 
This had been expected, and all preparations had been made. Snowball, who had studied an old book of Julius Caesar's campaigns, which he had found in the farmhouse, was in charge of the defensive operations. He gave his orders quickly, and in a couple of minutes every animal was at his post. As the human beings approached the farm building, Snowball launched his first attack. All pigeons, to the number of thirty-five, flew to and fro over the men's head and muted upon them from mid-air, and while the men were dealing with this, and the geese, who had been hiding behind the hedge, rushed out and pecked viciously at the calves of their legs. However, this was only a light skirmishing maneuver, intended to create a little disorder, and the men easily drove the geese off with their sticks. Snowball now launched his second line of attack. Muriel, Benjamin, and all the sheep, with Snowball at the head of them, rushed forward and prodded and butted the men from every side, while Benjamin turned round and lashed at them with his small hoofs. But once again the men, who with their sticks and their hobnail boots, were too strong for them, and suddenly at, at a squeal from Snowball, which was the signal for retreat, all the animals turned and fled to the gateway into the yard. The men gave a, gave a shout of triumph. They saw, as they imagined, their enemies in flight, and they rushed after them in disorder. This was just what Snowball had intended. As soon as they were inside the yard, the three horses, the three cows, and the rest of the pigs, who had been lying in ambush at the cow shed, suddenly emerged in their rear, cutting them off. Snowball now gave a signal for the charge. He himself dashed straight for Jones. Jones saw him coming, raised his gun, and fired. The pellet scored bloody streaks across Snowball's back, and the sheep dropped dead. Without halting for an instant, Snowball flung his fifteen stones against Jones's legs. Jones was hurled into a pile of dung, and his gun, f gun flew out of his hands. But most terrifying spectacle of all was Boxer, rearing up his hind legs and striking out with his great iron-shod hoofs like a stallion. His very first blow took a stable lad from Foxwood in the skull and stretched him lifeless in the mud. At sight, several men dropped their sticks and tried to run. Panic overtook them, and the next moment the animals together were, were chasing them round and round the yard. They were gored, kicked, bitten, trampled on. There was not an animal on the farm that did not take vengeance on them after his own fashion. Even the cat suddenly left the roof onto the cowman's shoulders and sank her claws into the neck, at which he yelled horribly. At that moment, when the opening was clear, the men were glad enough to rush out to the yard and make a bolt for the main road, and so within five minutes of their invasion, an ignominious, ignominious retreat by the same way as they came, with a flock of geese hissing after them and pecking at their calves all the way. All the men were gone except one. Back in the yard, Boxer was pawing with his hoof at his stable land, who lay face down in the mud, trying to turn him over. The boy did not stir. stir. He is dead, said Boxer sorrowful, sorrowfully. I had no intention of doing that. I forgot that I was wearing iron shoes. Who will believe that I did not do this on purpose? No sentimentality, comrade, cried Snowball, from whose wounds the blood was still dripping. War is war. The only good human being is a dead one. I have no wish to take life, not even human life, replied Boxer, and his eyes were full of tears. Where is Molly? exclaimed somebody. Molly, in fact, was missing. For a moment there, there was great alarm. It was feared that the men might have har harmed her in some way, or even carried her off with them. In the end, however, she was found hiding in the stall with her head buried among the hay in the manger. She had taken a flight as soon as the gun went off and when the others came back from looking for her, it was to find that the stable lad, who was in fact only stunned, had already recovered and made off. The animals had now re reassembled on their wildest excitement, each recounting his own exploits at the battle at the top of his voice. The impromptu celebration of the victory was held immediately. The flag was run up and Beast of England was sung a number of times, and the sheep who had been killed was given a solemn funeral, a hawthorn bush being planted on her grave. At the graveside, Snowball made a little speech, emphasizing the need for all animals to be ready to die for Animal Farm if it need be. 
the animals decided unanimously to create a military decoration, Animal Hero First Class, which was conferred there and then on Snowball and Boxer. It consisted of a brass medal. They were really some old horse brasses which had been found in the harness room. To be worn on Sunday and holidays. There was also Animal Hero Second Class, which was conferred po posthumously post on the dead sheep. There was much discussion to what the battle should be called. In the end, the name was given the Battle of the Cowshed, since that, that was where the ambush had been sprung. Mr. Jones' gun had been found lying in the mud and was known that there was simply uh, there was a supply of cartridges in the farmhouse if this if they decided to set the gun off on the foot of the flagstaff like a piece of artillery to fire twice a year once in october on the 12th the anniversary of the battle of the cowshed and once on midsummer day the anniversary of the rebellion